Um, wow. Are you ready? Sure. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's not let's not worry about how you got here. Let's pretend um, this guy wants to punch you in the face. Um, clearly, he's a threat. Um, and in this case, he probably wants to do so intentionally. He wants to uh, cause some sort of injury or harm to you. A tornado is also a threat. Um, you might have some sort of you know, philosophical or religious argument of whether it's intentional or not, but I think we can all agree it can cause some sort of harm. And um, that's what it has in common with the fist. But um, depending on where you live and how you're trying to protect yourself, um, you might want to think about one more than the other. Right? So if you're the kind of person that you know, lives in an area where tornadoes are very common, this is a very real threat to you. Whereas if you're the kind of person who frequents bars hitting on other people's significant others, maybe the fist is a more common threat. But um, really, the key here is there are many threats in our environment. And we need to really think about which ones are most relevant to us. This is a model. It's a simplified representation of something real, in this case, a car. Um, if this is, in fact, a, a very real representation of the car, then we can draw a couple of conclusions about the car. We can say, uh, generally, what's the shape of the car? What's the proportional size of the wheel to the rest of the car? Um, the more accurate the model is, the more conclusions we can draw. Um, I think uh, today most car manufacturers probably use software-based models, but um, they do leverage the design and the model of the car to actually draw conclusions about the safety before the car is even built. And that's very, very important. Um, you're not going to put the car on the road and then figure out what's wrong with it. So today I'm going to be talking about threat modeling. Um, basically, it's, a, it's an old technique to try to identify what threats any system will face before it goes out into a production type of environment. It's a design level activity. Um, you can think of it that way. Now, Threat Model Express is a, it's a, it's a unique type of threat modeling that we've, uh, we've come up with at Security Compass. And it tries to solve some of the challenges that we've seen with other kinds of threat modeling. Um, now, this is, um, it's not going to be any groundbreaking technical research or anything like that. It's more of a process driven type of discussion. So I hope that um, you guys can share your experience with me as well. Um, in fact, as I, was, uh, as I was flying in today, the gentleman beside me asked what I was doing. And I said, I'm going to a conference. and. I'm going to be doing a presentation, and he looked at me and said, oh, so, um, so, so you're the expert. Um, you, know, you know what we used to say about experts when I was, in t when I was teaching? An expert's a guy that, fl that, that drives 100 miles and tells you something that you already know. So I said, well, you know, it's 500 miles, and I hope the rest isn't true. So hopefully you get something. <laughs> Hopefully, get something out of this, um, you know, based on the experience here. Um, real quick um, background on Security Compass: We're an information security consulting and training firm specializing in software security. Um, so we help our clients build trustworthy software from the very first stages of the software development lifecycle. And naturally, threat modeling is one of the biggest activities in the design phase. So we do quite a bit of threat modeling. And over time, I've done threat modeling for many, many different organizations. Um, today, I oversee our consulting team. So I, I get involved in pretty much all of our client engagements. So I see how everyone is very different. Um, so this is just one type or one approach to threat modeling. It's not going to be perfect. So I, I, I definitely expect to see some raised eyebrows today as I'm, as I'm talking about this approach. Who here has done threat modeling? Okay, a few folks, okay. Um, so threat modeling, it's, you know, like I said, it's not an, a new technique. It started way back. Um, I think it was even leveraged in the World War during the military. So the idea was, you know, as you're, before you actually go out into battle, what you're gonna do is you're gonna think about what is it you're gonna face out there? 
you know, what are your threats? And then you look at yourself and you say, well, do I have the right defenses for that? You know, let, before I actually go out there, let me think about all this stuff. And you whiteboard it, you model it, you think about your environment, what you do, and uh, you basically defend yourself against the things that you realize that you currently don't have defenses for. Um, now, Microsoft um, really started pushing threat modeling. Um, they really pioneered threat modeling for application security. Uh, Microsoft's a big proponent of threat modeling. Um, they have uh, the Microsoft SDL, if you've heard of it. It's a security development lifecycle. It talks about threat modeling as one of the biggest activities in the design phase. And Microsoft has their own threat modeling technique, which is really popular. A lot of people will use it. They have tools for it. Um, that you can model your applications and it'll spit out a list of threats that it might face. So it's really, really useful. Um, and, you know, it works for Microsoft. It really started as something that Microsoft engineering teams used to do themselves. And they decided to kind of release this as an open source process that, you know, anyone else can, can follow. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of um, or challenges that I've seen to the Microsoft threat model um, approach. One is, um, it's very rigorous and documentation heavy. So for those of you who have done threat modeling, how, how long roughly has it taken you? Maybe just a random example of one threat model that you've done. Six months. Six months, yep. OK, very typical. A anyone else? Six months to a year. Six months to a year, yep. So that's a challenge, right, with, with threat modeling. It's, um, it can, you know, I think the, the, the shortest threat model I've ever done has been um, five to six days, and that's because we were really, really under pressure for time. And we just had to do something and, and um, you know, produce something within a certain time frame. But that's one big challenge is that it's a rigorous process. Um, you go through multiple steps. So what you do is you basically decompose your system into its various components. So let's say you have a web application, you're gonna end up with an app server, a database, you have your client, um, you might have this other application that you interface with, so you decompose everything. Sometimes that takes a long time. Um, you then talk about how does data flow between these systems, and the, the decomposition that I just did is actually pretty high level. You can actually dig even deeper and say, one of your components is your authentication piece and you know you have this authorization engine right and each of those become their own components and you talk about how data flows through each of them and once you have this these data flow diagrams or the DFDs you you think about okay well where is the trust and you know where is data coming in from an area that's not trusted and let's make sure there are controls in place right so so you can really really start digging in now for Microsoft it works because they, they have an understanding of ROI, of doing security earlier in the life cycle, and it's already pretty well established within Microsoft. And many companies, I'm not saying Microsoft is the only one, but in many of our clients' environments, one thing we notice is that they just wouldn't do threat modeling because it takes too long and they have a hard time justifying it. Right? They say, well, we don't want to spend six months on you know, doing this design level activity, well, where's the proof? You know, it, it just wasn't there yet. So um, Threat Model Express was something, it was a technique that we eventually developed that lets you do a threat model in eight hours. Really that's the idea, is that you should not spend more than eight hours on a threat model. What we've done is we've taken the parts that we think are most important and we've uh, put them into this, this process that leverages an organization's most important asset, it's people. Um, so it's a very people-oriented process. Um, now, it's definitely not for everybody, okay? It's, it's not comprehensive. You will not catch all the threats. I'll tell you that up front. Um, in fact, you will miss a large number of threats, but what you probably will catch are the ones that are most important to your business. So the prioritization is a big thing when it comes to Threat Model Express because we have um, limited resources and we have limited time, so we're going to try to focus is really the whole idea. And how you bring various individuals together is really at the center of all of this. And how do you bring the right individuals together? Um, so if you don't have buy-in for threat modeling, um, or uh, let's say you don't just have enough time within your project schedule, you might want to consider something like this or some variation of it. 
Um, it's very whiteboard driven and, and we'll get into all the various steps. Um, you don't have to settle here, right? You can start with a threat model like this and eventually work your way up to a more rigorous threat model process. Okay, so that's your ideal state really. You do want to catch all the threats. But let's start somewhere and not just completely um, shrug off threat modeling altogether, is the idea. It's really uh, broken down into five steps, but really two sub steps. You have your meeting, which is your last three steps, and you have your information gathering and you know, prep work, basically, which is your initial step. So really you do, you know, you have, you have somebody who is going to drive this entire thing, we call them the facilitator. They will do all the initial steps, they'll call the meeting, they'll get all the right people in the room, and, and this is where most of the magic happens, is actually in the last three steps of the Threat Model Express. I'll dig into each of these in a little bit of detail. Feel free to stop me, by the way, if any of this doesn't make sense or if you need to ask anything specific. So the first step is um, similar to any threat model, right? Let's, uh, let's figure out, let's focus, right? Why do we want to do a threat model? And what is it we want to, what, why are we doing a threat model? And, um, you know, what is it we're trying to get out of it? So our goals and our scope. So where, what, is, what is it that we're trying to model? Maybe you have a web application, but you only care about one component and not the other. Okay, so we'll talk about those as well. I think um, normally when people do threat modeling, they do it for um, kind of getting a better design for their system, right? This is, I think, one of the more common goals. If we're in a situation where we can modify the design or um, have an impact on the design, then let's do threat modeling. Maybe it's not, if it's not too late, right? You're already in the design phase, maybe you've gone through one or two iterations. Um, let's come up with the threats and come up with design um, techniques to defend against those threats. So this is one goal that you can possibly think about. I think this is a more obvious one when it comes to threat modeling. But another thing you can, uh, another goal that you can think of is, let's say you already passed design. Let's say your application is already completely built. You can still do threat modeling. What it does is that it helps you prioritize the threats that your application will face, and you can actually feed that into something like a, a code review or a pen test or some kind of security review that you're going to do further on. So we're often, you know, as consultants, we're put into situations where, you know, the client will say, "Well, here's my application, million lines of code, and um, you know, you have uh, two weeks max because that's all I can pay for. Um, you have to do your pen test and a code review." Right, so what do we do? We, we actually will put in the first day and do a threat model. Okay, because it, what it does is it gives us the threats that are most relevant to the company and we focus on those rather than just kind of going all over the code, basically doing a you know, surface scan or anything like that. There are better ways to spend your time or prioritize your time. So we'll come back to these goals. Um, what I'll do is I'll tie the process together with the goals in the end. So what should be in scope? Um, you can get really, really detailed when you do a threat model. I think this is one, one common issue I've seen with the way um, some companies currently do threat modeling. They'll look at an application and they'll start digging deeper and deeper and deeper and, and they just won't know where to stop. And that's why the threat model goes on for months, sometimes years. Right? If, you, if you think of some of the things that can be in scope, um, what about um, this, the server configuration, right, where the application is actually running on? Is that going to be in scope for your threat model? Um, or is it just the web app that's running on that server and the functionality that it serves? Um, what about um, interfaces to other applications? What about those other applications themselves? Are you threat modeling the entire process or are you just threat modeling this piece that you're looking at today, right? And it's, it's very important to be able to identify where your scope is and I, I would say pick, you know, two or three components at max 
and do a very thorough threat model of those and worry about the rest maybe in a different iteration, right? Do it in, in iterations, do it this way. Um, some developers, if they're ever involved in a threat model, they'll get caught up in um, you know, third-party libraries. Um, you know, is there gonna be a risk from this library that I'm using, right? Let's threat model that. All of a sudden, you're on this other tangent and you're working on that. Or, um, you know, what about the policies, the organizational policies that affect my application? Are those in scope? What about the users? Are they in scope for this threat model? Right? So really, really important to narrow down your scope. Um, normally what we do is we go in and, and we definitely start with, okay, let's look at the application from um, kind of a process perspective. That is, that's very important. You know, what is it doing? It's handling credit card transactions, let's say. Well, how does it handle credit card transactions? Those are definitely in scope. Okay. <laughs> is it time? Um, so yeah, just uh, you know, very important. Keep that in mind. Um, so I'll, I'll do a little bit of a case study as we go along in, in each of the steps. Um, this was based on a large bank that that we regularly do threat modeling for, and um, basically we went in there and we we were supposed to do a threat model of an application, and what we limited our scope to was the new code that was being written because. You know, we don't want to. We don't want to look at the entire application. Our, the focus of our review is the new stuff, right? So we define that as the goal, and uh, maybe outbound interfaces to other applications, but not the other applications themselves, right? So really, really focused. Um, and just for the sake of just future references to this case study, it was a redesign of presentation to your code that they're writing. And it was, um, I think it was a web application with, um, you know, handling retail products or something along those lines. And um, really, the, the reason here was that we wanted to do a code review and pen test. So that was our goal. Um, we wanted to find out, okay, what's important to this company? What can we focus on? Just going, uh, going back here to scope, I think one of the things you can do is um, let's say you want you really want to cover server configurations. Let's say you think it's really important. Um, do it once. Okay, so have a standard for the way you configure your servers, which I'm sure most companies have some type of, or another of hardening guidelines. And you know, do a threat model of the way you configure your servers and reference that in every threat model going forward. Okay, so you're still including it, but you're not really digging into the details every single time. And over time, you'll build this up. You'll build up all these, you know, threat model of these various components. Is that a, is that a nod as in yes, it's doable, or? Sorry, okay. Okay, now, we're, now we know why we're doing this, and let's, let's um, get ready for the meeting. What are the things we want to take with us? You know what, in reality, you don't need anything. Okay, to walk into this meeting, because you're gonna have the right people there to answer all these questions, but because your time is so limited, you wanna gather as much information as possible. Okay, so what is it that keeps our executives up at night? Okay, so for one company, it might be loss of data, or um, you know, some sort of fines associated with compliance. Um, for another, it might be financial loss, Right? So every company again is different. So let's let's find out why it is that why do we have an information security or application security program in the first place? Right? Think about all this stuff. It will come into play when you actually enter the meeting. Um, what's the application doing? If you can get a walkthrough, that, that would be great. If you can actually know what the system is doing and all the various features. As a facilitator, um, you will ask these ask these questions during the meeting, but the more you know, the less time you can spend on it and get to the real meat of the meeting. Um, use cases are very key to this. It's a very use case driven process, um, as is the standard threat modeling process. Okay, when you get into a meeting, you will walk through use cases at a time. Take your top, I would say, um, seven to ten use cases and focus on those. There's no way you'll cover every single use case. 
Um, architecture and design, um, I don't know if you can get them, sure. But I don't know about you guys, but in most cases, it's, it's very hard to come by. So it's some sort of documentation, right? Uh, what is the design of this? And, um, any sort of diagrams that you can bring with you. Um, any information about how security is currently handled? You know, are you doing blacklisting or whitelisting? Depends on what level of detail you want to get to. Bring that in with you. So surprisingly, with this client, um, they thought the reputational risk was the biggest thing for them. And that was, that was really a surprise, because normally you think of a bank and you think, well, you know, money, right? Financial fraud, um, compliance. But really, those, while those were there, it wasn't the biggest um, priority for them. So that was kind of an eye-opener. Eye and it affected the way that we did the threat model later. Um, they, they felt that it was such a competitive space that, you know, at this point in time, they were, you know, their strategy was focused on acquiring clients. Um, sometimes you might get, um, yeah, you know, you might, you might get a client or somebody who is, maybe your company that has a big target on their back. You know, like imagine if you're, if, um, you know, you're, you're a U.S. bank with, with some kind of, you know, the, the name U.S. or something in your name, right? Like your um, Bank of America or, or U.S. Bank. Right away, you might be a target, right? So that might be on, on the executives' minds. And it was a .NET app with a Java middle tier um, that, we need, that, that we just knew before walking in. So here's, um, here's when we're starting to actually walk into the meeting. Okay, so now we're gonna call on some people. And um, is, is that easy? I mean, can you, like, can you get people into a room that easily for, let's, if, I, if I were to say five hours? <laughs> no, I, five minutes. <laughs> five minutes? Okay. Can I dial in? You know, someone will be like, can I just call in? Can I send a delegate? Right, um, so. Um, the meeting will be, the meeting's actually ideally four hours, but you can, you can do it in two hours, um, and you can do it in two hour increments, is, is the way that we do it often. So you'll do a two hour initial meeting, and you'll take information away, and you'll do a follow up a few days later or something. So the idea is that it'll take eight hours total, it's not calendar eight hours. Okay, so two hours at a minimum, I think you can manage that, right? Should be doable. So who do we need? Someone with knowledge of the application, tech, from a technical perspective, okay, architect or develop, developer is extremely important. Somebody who knows the security landscape, and this is, this is one place that I've seen some companies do it differently. The facilitator that I mentioned that brings all this together, sometimes it's a security guy. You know, because threat modeling ends up becoming a security activity and you, know, you have to give, you know, put your resources towards it. So anyways, it doesn't matter who it is, but somebody who knows security in the room. I think we can all imagine why that's important. Um, somebody who knows the business perspective. So this person can bring in a completely different perspective in terms of what is it that's important. The security guy and the business person often do get into a battle in this meeting, but we resolve all the issues by the end. Almost mutually exclusive. <laughs> And um, compliance always comes in handy, right? Because it is a concern. So you don't need all of these people, but you definitely need somebody with technical knowledge of the application, somebody with the knowledge of the security landscape. I say business is important, um, and I have, I have an example of this. We were at one of our clients, and we were, kind of, we were doing a threat model on a feature that uh, basically let you um, suppress uh, paper statements it was a bank right so you can actually you know subscribe to e statements or whatever I'm sure most banks do this by now um, this was a while ago and in talking to the developers we're like okay well how you know so what so what if someone abuses this functionality and they said well you know it's not that big a deal like they'll just go online and you know let's say you don't want to suppress your statements but I can happen to go in and do it for you and so what? You just check it out online. Um, when talking to business, we found out that it's actually 
extremely, extremely important to the bank that this doesn't happen because it turned out that suppressing statements without the person's consent can actually put the bank in some serious trouble. Um, there's regulatory um, controls around that, or you, know, you have to abide by certain regulatory guidelines. So this is why business is important. They'll often come in and they'll give you a completely different view of what's important. Whereas traditional threat modeling, I think it's normally done by a security person and someone with arch architecture um, understanding, right? And sometimes you ask questions from business, but rarely do you have them all together. Yes? I mean, any time anytime you were, were doing this, you know, uh, the ultimate goal, I mean, you're trying to secure an app, you're trying to figure out the threat, but remember, it's all for the business. Mm -hmm. So, right. so uh, you know, I've, I've always been at the security side of that thing. And, and I've always made it a point, and I've always made it a very big issue. Anytime we're doing anything, it's a business decision. Mm -hmm. The business is part of that. Security and architects can't make decisions for the business. Absolutely. Yep. Security enables business, right? Ultimately. Yep. That's a very good point. And that's why it's, it's important. Um, I, I'm saying it's not mandatory because you don't want it to be your blocker either for doing um, a threat model. I mean, you can get away with doing a threat model and you know, getting it validated maybe later, and, and it's a little bit more painful. But in this meeting, yeah, it's absolutely important that you have somebody with that, with that viewpoint. Compliance is optional because I find um, the combination of the three other roles sometimes has a vague idea of, okay, what are the compliance requirements? So it, it does come out anyways. Um, maybe not to the level of detail that somebody from a compliance background will have. But you generally have an idea if your application has to be PCI compliant and what that means, you know, because you would have heard it by now. I hope. I would hope. Okay, so you got your people lined up. Take a couple of things in there with you as well. So you got your network architecture diagram. If you don't have one, um, honestly, I, I would recommend just whipping one together with just really basic, something really basic that you can reference in the meeting. Um, maybe get the architect's help with this. Um, risk chart is extremely important. Um, this later will use to actually um, prioritize threats together using sticky notes. Uh, flip charts will just help us keep track of the, the threats that we come up with and you know what happens is later the facilitator will take all this stuff away and, and properly put it down in some sort of document but while you're in the meeting it's very ad hoc and any sort of documentation that you can get your hands on would be, um, would be good to have. So I think I have, um, I have a wrist chart, like a massive wrist chart that I just take with me everywhere I go and I you know, can fold it up and everything. So it doesn't have to be really pretty, but just something that you can reference. If you don't have a wrist chart, just use a whiteboard and draw the axes. It's good enough. So now is the toughest part. Actually, the, the funnest part and the toughest part is trying to think about threats. Okay, so so far we have all the right people in the room and they're all sitting around the table and they're saying, okay, Let's do this. And as a facilitator, your job is to try to get them to think about threats that the application faces. Microsoft prefers using Stride. Okay, if you haven't heard of Stride, it stands for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and escalation of privileges. So you use stride to come up with threats. So you, so you start with yes and you say, well, what are the various ways somebody can spoof anything in this application, or can they? And it, and it kind of gets people thinking, right? You start to think, well, yeah, you know, if I'm logging in and you know, maybe if they can somehow retrieve my password using a forgot password feature or something, right? They come in as me. Um, that can also be a repudiation issue actually because you can't tell who logged in but you can go through each of these in the room and, and get and get people's um, uh, input now way way back in the day when when I first saw stride I I was actually using it in the wrong way I was using it to categorize threats right so whenever we would come up with a threat I would say okay where does it fit you know is it a spoofing is it tampering 
it doesn't matter. Right? It really doesn't matter. That's not what it was intended for. It's intended for actually coming up with threats. It's a brainstorming activity. You can also use other um, techniques, like let's talk about the OWASP top 10. You know, let's say if the room is really technical and they understand that, let's talk about you know, um, injection flaws, let's talk about authentication, session management. You can actually start going down that route too. Or you can say, you know what, let's talk about CWEs, the common weaknesses enumeration. One, one technique that we use and I find very, very helpful to get the discussion going is the attacker motivations. A few of these are very obvious, um, like um, financial gain. You know, why, why would somebody want to attack this application? And the attacker motivations will be different for every application that you look at and every environment. So in certain environments, causing harm to human safety might be the reason why someone might want to hack you. Okay, so imagine if you're in a healthcare environment and you have a, you're working on an application that you know, holds um, records and you know, it's, uh, those records are actually being relied on for making decisions from a health perspective. You can possibly cause harm to human safety, or if, you're, if it's a traffic, air traffic control system, right? That can be a threat. Whereas, if it's a banking system, probably not, right? So you go through these one by one in the room, and you say, okay, well, does, would somebody want to leverage this to get financial gain? Yeah, sure. If it's moving money around, definitely, right? So let's talk about ways that they can actually do this. So. It's, it's key to understand why somebody wants to attack you. Maybe they just want to grab personal records and, and sell them. Okay, or maybe they just want to, a malicious user might want to get access to someone else's, someone very specific's record, right? Can that be done? Um, maybe they don't care to make money, maybe they want to hurt you, right? They want to cause financial harm to your company. Why? I, I can't tell you right now because I don't know your company, but think about this. There might be reasons why, I mean, other than competitive advantages, why you might have partners or somebody that wants to hurt your company. Anonymous. Anonymous, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is um, kind of an obvious one. I think people do think about this, right? Maybe one of my competitors wants to get access to the system because it holds some very um, proprietary information. Remember Bank of America or um, US Bank? Yeah, maybe, you know, if, if I can deface one of their websites, sorry, not me, but um, if somebody is wanting to deface one of their websites and send a statement, that would be a way to do it, right? Whenever I work with um, any bank that has some sort of political affiliation, they will say this is somewhat important to them. This is an interesting one. You usually don't think about this, but somebody wants to leverage your system to not hurt you, not for their own gain, but to hurt somebody that you work with. Right? So they're leveraging you as a pathway to attack your stakeholders, like um, your other, your users, let's say, or your partners that maybe are interfacing with this application. Maybe, in certain cases. And uh, this kind of ties into competitive advantage, but maybe they just wanna make sure you make bad decisions as a company. Um, if they can get into a system that's holding critical marketing data at about you know, how you're going to maybe um, shift your strategy for your online marketing or, or, the, or the products that you offer, maybe they can affect that system, right? So there are certain systems that are key to your decision making. And of course, um, maybe they just want to take you offline for a couple hours. Any others that I missed? Or? Pretty much covers it. So money, hurting people, that's pretty much it. Good stuff. <laughs> general fund. <laughs> Sorry? General, general fund, fund, yeah, actually that's a good one. But I, yeah, I think that would apply to any app, right? Or any any um, environment. Because it's there. 
Just because it's there? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I'm just learning. I want to use you as an example. Which yeah. was a big thing a decade ago. You know, financial yeah. oh, gain yeah. was never all that much. It was just mainly mischief. Absolutely. Yeah. Facing websites, just seeing how many machines you could take down. Right. Doing their stripes, right? right. Yeah. 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 I mean, it still happens, but, but maybe not, not to that extent. Scale. Yeah. People that do that now become targets of the mob, though. Right. So you don't want to get caught doing that. Right. On a big scale. Well, there's an ease too. I mean, you know, all those assume that somebody's after you directly. But if your systems aren't secured, you know, hackers are scanning. They don't really care who it is. They go after the ones that aren't protected. That's right. Yeah. So are you the lowest hanging fruit kind of thing, or the weakest link? Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. I yes. think I think they do care. It just depends on who the t attacker is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you could. Yeah, but thinking about what what threats you face, that can yeah, that can absolutely be one of them for anybody. Oh. Yes. Some some attacks I've seen hacktivist types do, they seem to be. I'm not sure they actually have a goal in mind. Like I think it is looking for low hanging fruit. Then let's make a political agenda after we find someone we can get in on. <laughs> yeah. Well, anonymous. Anon I think anonymous has an agenda. But anonymous isn't a single group though. Anonymous isn't really a. It's a me Anonymous is not a group. It's a meme. The shared banner term that people use, but it's not really a group group. There were subgroups that have like maybe leaderships and so forth, but sorry, go ahead. Yes, yeah, I was gonna make a similar point to Adrian. Uh, it does seem to me that Anonymous hacks something and then says, Oh wait, we were able to break into the uh, the uh, Scottsdale, Arizona police department. Okay, so now wait a second, let's come up with a political reason <laughs> to do that. And it, yeah. it very much seems like it's after the fact. Um, but the other the point I wanted to make about the political stuff is the political agenda doesn't actually need to make sense as a political agenda. Because you might think, oh, well, you know, I'm an auto parts dealer. You know, it's like, who could have a political agenda with me? And it's like, well, yeah, but in, a, in crazy person world, right, there is a political agenda to doing this. Yeah. And, and there's somebody and out maybe there. Maybe their political motivation right. it doesn't necessarily need to make sense. Right. And that's, um, yeah, that's actually kind of scary because you might not realize that someone's after you. And right. I mean, there was a tweet, I, I got a crypto tweet recently. It was, uh, it was uh, a homeless looking person walked up to a stranger on the street, gave him $50 and this crypto message. Can anyone figure out what this means? And it was like, no one knows what it means. You know, it's like, go figure that action out. You know, it's like, homeless person gives you fifty dollars and a cryptographic message. Yeah. I don't know what that means. You yeah. know, and that's kind of where the political stuff is going to be. It doesn't necessarily even make a lot of sense. Right. Okay. So, so in our in our case study, um, our 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 client was interested in threats for financial gain because, and this was actually based on. Usually it is too based on experience, right? Um, they see that people are trying to steal money. Um, political statement was a big one for them because of some, you know, whatever they were involved in, they knew they were a target. And, um, you know, stealing personal records and of course just, you know, just trying to stay online was, was important to them. So as we talk about this, I mean, as you can see, kind of, even in the room here, it kind of gets everyone thinking of, okay, well, Let's talk threats, right? Let's talk threats and why. And so, so far we've identified why. The next step is to think about how. Okay, so we started kind of very high level and said, what's important to you? What's it, what is it that keeps you up at night? And once we know that, let's talk about how do we actually make that happen with this system that we're looking at. So, what you care about and what attackers could be after are really two things that come together to think of, to make up what should we prioritize over another. And sometimes these two are actually very different, right? So you might care about, you know, keeping keeping your financials safe, but attackers are trying to hack you for, you know, as you mentioned, for some unknown reason that you have no idea and you're still a target. So you need to consider both together and when we prioritize, we'll talk about both together. It's never one or the other. So we look at each use case. Okay, so we picked, I think, uh, I think we said seven to 10. Let's go through each use case now and say, okay, now that we already talked about all the various reasons why someone would hack us, 
Let's talk about this one use case and say, does it apply? Okay, and one thing I want to point out is it's important to not get into technology um, threats here. So let's not talk about someone can do SQL injection or cross-site scripting. Um, let's talk about what is it they want to do. Okay, so if, if financial um, gain was a threat, and let's say this was an online banking scenario, we would say, well, the move money feature, which is one use case, somebody might want to move money from their account or someone else's account into theirs. Okay? Now, we, we've thought about a scenario. Okay? We've thought about something that somebody possibly wants to do. We haven't really thought about how would somebody do that from a technical perspective. That's the next step. The reason for this is that the how changes over time, and it can change over time, depending on new threats, new, um, new attack vectors that come out. If you change your technology, it could, it could change. But the, the actual threat of someone moving money into their own account will never change for this use case, unless you actually change the functionality. So let's keep track of what are the various ways someone can abuse a use case, abuse cases, which is what Microsoft refers to them as. So we keep track of those, and um, you know we have we have this ongoing discussion of, okay, well you know is it important? Is it not? Very important again to time box your use case discussions. And usually we say about 10 to 15 minutes per use case. Let's not go over that. You can really, really get out of hand here because people, believe it or not, get really involved, right? Even, you know, representatives from business are usually the first ones to start throwing out threats, believe it or not. Talking about ways to abuse a use case. Um, that can go on and on and don't throw anything out. Don't um, basically shut anyone down. Document everything and time box yourself. And we're gonna move to the next phase where we talk about prioritizing them. So now that we know how or why somebody wants to attack this use case, now it's where we get into, okay, um, someone can do this through, you know, you want to move money from one account to the other, maybe you do some sort of um, parameter manipulation, right? As you're, as you're sending a request to move money, maybe you can change the parameter to something else, <coughs> right? So you do eventually get to this technical level, but it's important to separate them. Good question. Yes. Uh, in, in, in the modeling up to this point, um, is, is, have you ever or has ever considered uh, uh, the stupid employee factor, mm -hmm. the idiot behind the keyboard, mm -hmm. in this threat modeling? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's why I was saying um, initially, if that's in scope, right? right? So you need to define um, if, if people are in scope, then your end users will be something you consider okay. as a way to actually carry out a specific threat. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Uh, in most cases, though, I have to say we've kept that out, you know, um, because I think it's more of an organization-wide decision and something that needs to be done for us users across applications, mm -hmm. rather than very specific to functions of this system that we're dealing with today. So it will be dealt with usually in, in different uh, ways yeah. at a higher level. Okay, so um, as an example, here we're talking about the, the use case where a user signs up for a new credit card. Okay, so the threats that we came up with here, maybe the user can, a malicious user can gain access to all credit card applications. That would be pretty bad. Um, maybe the user can sign up for a credit card on, on behalf of another user. That's also pretty bad. Maybe you can view the applications of other users. Maybe you can modify applications of other users. We're not talking about technical threats here yet. We've talked about how you could abuse this use case. And then we move on to say, well, this use case can be abused by this, this, or that. And you, kind of, you, you do have a mapping. It's not really represented properly here, but you do keep track. Um, it's important because when we prioritize um, we're going to actually talk about the likelihood and impact of each of these. And when we do recommendations or ways to protect ourselves, we leverage these to actually come up with countermeasures. Okay, so knowing that a user can gain access to someone else's app 
or your application, um, you can't really come up with a countermeasure unless you know the way that someone's exploiting it. Now this is the fun part, and it takes um, probably the majority of your meeting. So this is our risk chart. Um, I usually divide it in quadrants. I find for the sake of keeping things time boxed and on track, you don't want to really get stuck in discussions of is it a three or a four, right? You don't really want to get there. Um, you just want to say, okay, from an impact scale, is it in the top part or in the bottom part? Right, so is this really important to our, um, is it gonna have a huge impact to our company or not so much? And you do the same for likelihood. Now there's a number of factors obviously that go into likelihood. Right, it's um, you know, based on what we talked about, is it something that the average user could do? Do you have to be authenticated? Right, a lot of factors. And again, pick the quadrant and you basically, you've left, you're left with four quadrants and you start mapping You start mapping your threats or your um, abuse cases to the risk chart. Now this is done with everybody in the room and this is where there's often quite a bit of discussion. Right? Um, I think most risk adverse companies tend to want to push everything in the top right. You know, especially the security person in the room will always be like, no, no, higher, higher, no, it's gotta go right, it's gotta go right. Whereas the business is like, no, you know, let's, uh, let's kind of keep moving it this way to the bottom left. But if you end up with everything in the top right, you haven't gained anything in this activity, right? You haven't prioritized your threats. You've identified your threats, sure, you're, you're a little better off than you were before, but you don't know how to fix them now, right? You don't know how to prioritize, you're just randomly shooting. Yeah? Do you use likelihood? Is the likelihood it will be attempted or it will succeed? Both, actually, yeah, it does come up. Yeah, that, that discussion often comes up. So the security person will say um, it's easy to do, right? And then um, someone else in the room will say, well, we've never seen that before, you know, how do we know? Are we, are we a target? Um, and that's when you go back to your attacker motivations and say, well, we all, we all decided that this is something someone might want to try. If you're exposed to the internet, it likelihood is 100%. <laughs> Someone's going to attempt a SQL injection against yeah. every exposed yeah. thing to the internet. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's inevitable. Yeah, likelihood of trying it. I mean, I wouldn't say 100 percent, but yeah, it's uh, it's very very likely. Unless you're, you know, within 24 hours. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay that I'll agree with. Yeah, minutes. I'll agree with that. Sure. I mean, if you're a, if you're a nobody and no one visits your website and they can't find it on Google, you're probably safe. Uh, but if you're uh, uh, of any known entity or you're a bank, yes. I, I'd have to say every bank, I, I would 100%. Agree. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree. Um, now, keep in mind, this could be an internal application too, so True. it depends, True. right, in certain cases. But yeah, I agree. Like, I think, I think some of the low-hanging fruit usually end up um, doing a likelihood that's pretty high. Now, another thing to consider is this is, we have to make sure this is relative likelihood. Right? Because this is going to affect our, our remediation efforts going forward and how we prioritize our risks. So if everything in OWASP top 10, we say the likelihood is high because that's what people try, again, you're going to end up with a situation where you end up with everything on the right. right? So it's important to keep that r relative nature in mind as well. Um, I find that usually helps because when I bring that up, I think people start to think a little differently and say, okay, you know what? Maybe it's not as easy, maybe it's not as likely, right, based on my experience. Um, so yeah, th th definitely this part here will, you'll spend a lot of time coming up with these um, prioritizations. It's key for the facilitator to know where to draw the line. Sometimes you gotta make some really tough calls. But what happens is when you end up with your final list, even though the facilitator sometimes just made a decision that not everyone agreed with, when you walk out of that meeting with a prioritized list, no one can really say, well, you know, I don't agree with the results of this threat model, right? Because they were there, they took part in the discussions, right? They all, they all had their input, and it's the best way to get security and business to ultimately agree on something in the end, right? So when you walk out of here, I, 
I've very rarely seen somebody come back and argue what happened inside the meeting, right? Even though there are times that I know business doesn't agree or security doesn't agree, but you pick something. That's really the, the, the I guess, the key and the, and the power behind doing a people-based process is that everyone's input counts. And the last part here, um, basically, you've got your list of threats and your, t and your technical enablers. And let's just start talking about, well, what is it we need to do? Now, you might look at this and say, well, it's pretty generic, right? It's like, um, this is OWASP top 10 stuff. I could have told you this without going through this whole threat model. Um, I, I think it just comes off that way in this example. But sometimes you do have very, very business logic specific defenses that, uh, for example, you can say, one of my defenses is going to be every time somebody is moving money from um, you know, one account to the other, I'm going to make sure that there, you know, there's no parameters being passed with account ID or something like that. Right? That's very specific to that use case. And you can actually take that and you can test for it. Um, in this scenario, it's something you can um, do like a code review for or something, right? To actually check against these defenses that we're talking about here. So your defenses are going to be both in technical nature, process nature, um, and sometimes in between. So that was our that was our threat model. Now going back to our goals, if our goal was a secure design, the countermeasures we came up with is what we're going to go back and check for in our design. Okay, now it could be a design thing, countermeasure, it could be a code level countermeasure, but we can actually go back and we can change it if we're, if we're in that situation where we still have the ability to change it. If your goal was to guide an assessment, well now you got a ton of stuff that you can try that you know is important to the company or to um, this application. Um, so if you have five days, you can focus your five days based on what you see here, right? You can kind of work your way down. And all of this in eight hours. So the trade-off, and I think um, some of this has become, I think I alluded to some of this earlier. You need an AppSec person, so that's your second point here. You need an application security or security person in the room. Sometimes that's your limiting factor, right? So if you can't get that person, Maybe this isn't for you, right? You need somebody to talk about threats and risks and be able to articulate those in front of others and articulate it well. Um, and um, you know, think about it in the way that if you do have an AppSec person, they're only there during that meeting, right? During that two-hour meeting, it's a pretty efficient use of their time. If you don't have an AppSec, AppSec person, I would recommend getting one for sure. Um, the very important point at the top is that you're sacrificing breadth and depth. Okay, so this is good for most applications. If your application is a very complex and important one, so let's say you're doing an air, air traffic control system, or um, if it's like a, a browser, right? Um, maybe it's some sort of complex protocol. Maybe you don't want to do a threat model express. You really want to dig into it. Okay then do the traditional threat modeling, or the SDL Microsoft um, version of threat modeling. Um, but definitely, if you're not doing threat modeling, use this as a start, as a starting point. So spend your eight hours. I find usually it's easy, easier to convince business to give you that time, if it's only a couple of hours. And your results will never be perfect. You'll, you'll miss threats, and you should be OK with that. Yeah, you know, but you can spend six months and screw up just as bad. That's right, yeah. You'll never know you're perfect, right? Mm -hmm. And I always, I always put it into perspective and say threat modeling, it's one of many activities you should be doing. So why do, you, why, why do people feel like they have to get it perfect in a threat model, right? If you miss something in a threat model, I, I hope you're going to be doing a pen test anyways. I'm not saying it, it's not going to replace anything. Right? It's just there to catch vulnerabilities or threats earlier, <coughs> allow you to fix them earlier, save time and money in the long run. Yes? I think it brings in an interesting business perspective, like 
So I'm always like looking at SQL injection. Okay, this is a SQL injection. But then you said, okay, moving money from here or this account from here to there, I don't see that a lot. Like business people saying, well, this is a process related vulnerability. I'm always looking at the technical side. Mm -hmm. So there's value to bringing in business people where they, they you know, share the process related stuff. Absolutely, yeah. So, sometimes the, the, wrong, the threat is in the way the process is laid out, right? So it's not yes. technical at all. It's, yeah. it's you know, you just exactly. missed a step or exactly. something. Exactly, it has, there's been more, and, and, and then in the, the, the end product, the process that you built into the end product that the end user follows to get from A, B, C, D, E, F through the application to do that transaction or move money uh, is probably the most in, in, intriguing aspect of assessing a product, in my opinion. We can all go out there and, and get some crappy program like WebInspect and throw it against a, a program, <laughs> and we get this low-hanging fruit cross-site scripting and all that junk, go blah, 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 blah. The most fascinating thing in the assessment is to evaluate the uh, implemented business process within an application Absolutely. and seeing if that can be leveraged to break down. Uh, a, a prime example is, is a business process that uh, uh, that doesn't force an order. And you've mm -hmm. seen this a lot of times. So instantly I can jump to process seven yeah. or six, which validates my credit card before I can actually, before I purchase. Instead of making a purchase, validate against that purchase. I check a validation, it validates my card, and then I do the purchase. My card doesn't have to have any money available on it. Now it'll validate it for my card, ship my order, and when they try to bill it out, they get no money because the mm -hmm. business process that was deployed in the application is flawed. And this process gives you the ability to evaluate that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Take out those threats. So. Some of the highest threats, um, vulnerabilities we see are with processes, actually. Because it's a... Uh, Those are the it's coolest a, to find. Yeah, the coolest findings, yeah. And um, also, it's the one. Th it's the things you really didn't think about. You know, no one thought about it. And it has a big impact. Well, um, isn't a lot of that true? Because a lot of businesses don't know what the real process is. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, getting... You should, I would think yeah. you want to be doing this modeling all the way through, just like you do risk management all the way yeah. through. Not just up front. But as you go through and learn more, you go back and visit. Sure. Or be right. Or do we need to add something? Or do we need to change our priorities as you learn more? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah incorporate that into a best practices model. Well, let's not get too complicated. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I really like this this, this eight-hour model. Uh, and, and it's the same yeah. thing with doing, it, it almost applies to the whole thing with risk assessment process. Mm -hmm. People think, oh, risk assessment is this long, drawn-out process. But yet you could take various defined risk assessment processes like FRAP yep. and downsize them and do them in a single day mm -hmm. and you get rid of, uh, you know, you, you reduce your overall risk, you get rid of that low hanging fruit, mm -hmm. you know, those obvious type things that you can find with them. You don't get everything, you're not going to get everything here, but yet in the end game you're going to produce something that's going to be a little more stronger, a little more effective, uh, uh, reducing your overall risk just with a little bit of work, eight hours. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. Yeah, I agree with Daryl. This is an awesome briefing and appreciate the presentation. I just see, see one problem or one challenge as I'm thinking about implementing something like this. It's a transition from discussing, you know, the use cases of what an attacker could do to now associating the technical approaches of, and enablers of how they're going to do that. You know, that's pretty hard because now we've got to, you know, envision the scope of all the technical approaches to hack a system and to achieve certain objectives and figure out exactly what some, you know, uh, motivated attacker is going to do or and, and, and necessarily how they're going to right. achieve that. And, I, I see that as the biggest challenge here is associating the the, the concept with with the technology. Yeah, no, it's it is challenging. So sometimes, um, even even from a pen testing perspective, you know, I, I mentioned we do this sometimes as a step before pen testing. Um, sometimes what you end up with is a threat model output that says, um, you know, the threat is someone can move money from their account into someone else's account into theirs. That's a, that's the abuse case, 
and here are the technical enablers that whoever it was that did the threat model came up with. But then you, you get that input, and as a pen tester, you come up with many different ways to do that same thing. Right, but it's the abuse case that really matters in that case. Exactly, yeah. like we'll have maybe a half a dozen red teams mm -hmm. that are assigned to basically do the same thing. And it's amazing the variety of ways that each one of yeah. those red teams will achieve that objective, right. and they'll all do it different. That's right. But they'll get to this, you know, the same end result, but, but the way they get there is so different. And, and that's what's so hard in this process, I would think, is to associate, you know, those techniques with technologies. Yeah. Because is there some technique or some method that you use for that? Um, it, it's really all on, on the on the security person in the room, unfortunately, in that situation, um, to come up with the various things. It's definitely imperfect, and I'll tell you there are situations where I. I personally will skip that that step. I'll focus on what's the what's the threat, what's the abuse case, and that's the biggest value that I think comes out of a threat model. So I, I completely agree with you. I think it's and it's one of those steps too that not everybody in that room needs to be there. You know, it's like you're talking about technical enablers, right? So maybe maybe what you could do is take that away and and spend more time on your own, kind of coming up with different. Um, Technical enablers. We used to we used to do something like that. Uh, and last company I worked for, a large Fortune 500, uh, would would actually come up with they would come up with ideas. This is what we want to do. This is this is our ultimate goal. Uh, and the CTO and one of the other technical guys would call a meeting. They go, Daryl, we want to have a meeting. So and and I used to refer to it as attack modeling. Yeah. And, uh, very similar to this, we'd spend a day in a room. And they would show whatever they want to do. They would lay out technically and theoretically where this was all going. And my whole, my total goal was to stand there and throw crap at them uh, and poke holes in it and tell them this would fail. This is how I would do this. This is how I would attack that. Mm -hmm. and, and we would we would completely after they modeled their entire solution, I would disassemble it in front of them. You know, in, on a whiteboard, right. and that's how we would do the entire thing. And then they would take it back to the drawing board, and they would move from there. Yep. Yeah, I always say threat modeling is something that most people do in their head. You, you do threat modeling every day. Everyone does it. This is just our way of formalizing it, you know, and articulating it in a process that can be implemented over and over. But yeah, absolutely, it's um, everyone does it differently. You know, if you created one, they could probably poke holes at yours. Right, and oh, yeah. vice versa. Yeah. Poking holes and things is easier than, yeah. than, than <laughs> the other part. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, if you do, if you do have any um, follow-up right. questions, you can. Red team always wins. Um, <laughs> <laughs> always. Yeah. Uh, you can reach out to me at Saba at Security Compass. Um, check out our lab site. We got a ton of resources on there, including some articles about threat modeling, um, and you can follow us on Twitter. If you're interested in um, mobile stuff. I have a couple of um, mobile security kind of cheat sheets over here that you can grab, as well as if you, we do have a free OWASP Top 10 CBT on our website, so the link for it is on here if you want to come grab that as well later. A couple of good tools, SQL injection, plus I. Yeah, we've, yeah we also have a few tools we built for, um, as Firefox plugins, um, Firefox add-ons that you can do cross-site scripting, SQL injection access checks, and they're, they're free, you can grab them from the Mozilla add-on site. Um, they're called XSS Me, SQL Inject Me, and Access Me, part of the Exploit Me tools. And you can also grab it on our lab site, actually, you can go through that, too. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, now we, we have a cake. Obviously, everyone has to stay for a piece of cake. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and do some prize drawings here in a minute. So, you want to do some prizes while I get the cake? No, let's get everyone eating cake and get them, get them moving back to, the, to, to their chair or cake or whatever. Okay. 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 Okay.